So we're going to go ahead and uh, journey to Italy, and we're going to end up under the shadow of Mount Vesuvius. Now, this is today a very active volcano. Uh, so I uh, hate to tell you this, but uh, uh, it covered Pompeii back in 79 CE, and it could indeed cover Pompeii again. Uh, this is something that does worry uh, many archaeologists that, uh, you know, Pompeii is, is a resource, but it could very well be a limited resource. So I would recommend uh, for those uh, individuals who are interested in uh, Pompeii that if you ever have a chance to go there, <laughs> you may want to visit uh, because you never know what nature may decide when it comes to the fate of this wonderful uh, treasure when it comes to Roman antiquity. So, you know, just don't go there <laughs> when, it, when it erupts again, because <laughs> we don't want archaeologists to find you and to pour a plaster casting of you uh, in another 2,000 years from now. So uh, that probably would not be uh, the best of ideas. But, uh, you know, when it comes to volcanoes, uh, you know, people say, well, we know when it's going to happen, but sometimes we don't. And the, re the reality is it can happen any time. All right. But, hey, you know, we're used to these kinds of ideas of the unexpected, right, with the surge going on. Uh, it's almost like a, an eruption, in a sense, uh, hitting so many. But I'm glad you're here, and I'm hope hoping that most of you are healthy uh, getting through this. Uh, so let's go ahead and talk about Pompeii. Now, at the time of the eruption of Mount Vesuvius in the year 79 CE, uh, the town had about 11,000 inhabitants. And that's, that's a, it's a pretty big city uh, from Roman perspectives. Uh, and it was located uh, in the holiday center of, of, of the empire, Campania. This is where the wealthy, this is where the privileged, this is where those who are seeking a, well, <laughs> a Roman holiday <laughs> outside of Rome would love to go and spend their time. Uh, it is a beautiful area sprinkled with villas and lush vegetation and vineyards. And, and so, yeah, it's the holiday destination. So uh, thinking about Pompeii in a modern sense, uh, it would be like uh, Laguna Beach or, or, you know, something like that of sense. Th that makes sense. So let's go a little bit further. Um, uh, it is uh, the only ancient town of which the whole topography uh, is known precisely as it was with no later modifications. So it's, it really is frozen in time because of the eruption. Uh, we take a look at Pompeii. Uh, it has a typical grid system of very straight uh, uh, streets. To a certain extent, uh, it has, in a sense, uh, the uh, uh, you know laid out uh, with with houses and shops on either side of the road. Uh, details are preserved of everyday life. <clears throat> what I want to do is I want to paint a picture for you of this region and. I think the best person to paint that picture from the context of ancient times is a person by the name of Pliny the Elder. Now, I'm going to bring him up. It's very important because guess what? Pliny the Elder was one of those who died during the eruption of Mount Vesuvius. Uh, he is the uncle to Pliny the Younger. So I, I think that um, hearing his words, uh, about this region kind of tells you why he moved here in the first place. So let's hear this portrait that he has of Campania. He says Campania is the region in which Pompeii uh, what existed. He says, how can one describe even the coast of Campania with all of its flourishing and splendid pleasantries in a manner that demonstrates how, in a moment of grace, the potent creator called nature concentrated her efforts in a single location, and all of the vivifying and uninterrupted wholesomeness, the mildness of the climate, 
the fertile land, the charming hills, the safe passes, the shadowy forests, such variety and richness in the woods, winds that blow down from a multitude of hills, such fertile crops, vineyards, and olive trees, as well as the full-mantled sheep, the fattened bulls from the hills, so many places, so much abundance in the rivers and springs, the sea and its ports, and the land's open lap upon which the population exchange goods. And it is she who, in order to assist men, slopes gently towards the sea, and the character and customs of its inhabitants and populations conquered by their language and values. Even the Greeks praise this land, a population that is always ready to glorify itself, and even named a portion of Italy, Magna Graecia. You see, you can see uh, he has a deep love of this land. It is beautiful. It is where you want to go. Uh, and it's more than just Pompeii. Uh, it's, of course, uh, Herculaneum and Neapolis and Stabe. Uh, this is, you know, you know, the area of Capri. Uh, it is beautiful. And it is a bread basket. Uh, <clears throat> but, uh, in fact, um, we have some images uh, that have survived uh, from this period of time. One of these images uh, was uh, discovered at the House of the Centennial. Uh, there's a wall painting uh, from the Larium uh, in the small atrium of the house. The Larium is where they uh, worship the local spirits of the region. There is a, a nice fresco, and it depicts um, uh, Bacchus uh, with a cantoris, which is a wine cup. Uh, and uh, a panther and a tall staff. Uh, and he's adorned head to toe uh, with large bunches of grapes. And he stands at the foot of an isolated mountain, which is Vesuvius, uh, whose slopes are partially covered with vineyards. Uh, and when you take a look at this, it's kind of interesting because you see that Mount Vesuvius has a single sharp peak on top. Now, today you take a look at Vesuvius and it's concave, right, at the top. And so you realize that when they were seeing this image, there was no way they could know that this was a volcano, right? From their perspective, right? You know, not like Mount Etna in Sicily. Uh, for them, I mean, you know, it's, it's fully covered with a nice mountainous peak. So you can imagine when the explosion happened, all of that dirt, all of that soil <clears throat> went into the atmosphere. It literally blew off the top of the mountain. Uh, so, you know, had a single peak. Now, uh, recent studies uh, have, have uh, concluded that uh, immediately west of the city, the line of the coast ran approximately one kilometer from the city walls. And that the sea was a mere, uh, at one point, uh, 600 to 700 meters from the Porta Marina. Uh, so uh, if you've been to Pompeii, you realize the sea is not there anymore. <laughs> so it's moved uh, quite a bit of ways. But uh, uh, still, so Pompeii really was uh, a seaside place. Uh, the, the Pompeii is set at an average elevation of 25 to 30 meters above uh, sea level. Uh, we know uh, from the various frescoes and what is preserved as a result of the eruption, uh, so much of the uh, plant life. Uh, when it comes to uh, the, uh, when it comes to what we see from the frescoes, uh, out of the 125 various plants, 102 have been identified. And for me, this is kind of exciting. I was like, what? The plants? What's so exciting about foliage? <laughs> well, it's interesting because you really see and learn how much of a breadbasket this place is. Uh, there is a tremendous amount of biodiversity. Uh, most uh, of the, the most frequent, of course, are fruit trees. And there are 23 different kinds of varieties. 
Um, so you can see this is kind of the place you want to go uh, if you want to enjoy uh, some fresh fruit. And what's represented has surprised many scholars because, yes, the melon plant has been discovered there. Also, the cherry tree, the lemon tree, and the peach tree were all present before the eruption of Mount Vesuvius. Again, this kind of surprises some people uh, that there is so much in the way of variety. Uh, and they're all new arrivals. They just arrived. What I'm saying is into the West. For example, the melon was cultivated by the Emperor Tiberius on the island of Capri. Uh, and uh, he was the one who helped cultivate it. And then it spread to the coastline. The cherry tree was imported from Pontus, which is Anatolia. And it was imported in 74 BCE by Lucius uh, Lucullus. Uh, and so that means is that uh, the cherry, you know, the cherry tree just arrived in Italy at that time and had been, you know, by the time of the eruption had been being cultivated for about 150 years. Uh, now, it's interesting also uh, that um, uh, very recently, it was believed the Arabs brought the lemon tree to Italy in the 11th century. And that was the perception. It turns out that we were wrong. The lemon uh, tree had been there before. Uh, there was a fresco in the house of the orchard in Pompeii that shows that the lemon tree did exist, uh, but somehow it did not survive uh, after a certain while and had to be rediscovered. So, yes, the Romans did have lemons. <laughs> you know? And the other part that's interesting is that... Um, uh, peach trees. I mean, you know, when you think of Italy, you know, you don't right away think of peaches, but peaches were there. They were brought in 30 CE from Persia. And uh, think about it, 30 CE, the Persia brought to Italy. So from 30 CE to 79 CE, they're, you know, they're being cultivated in this area. So you got, you got peach trees, right? And uh, we know that for a fact because and we know that the we know that the Romans love peaches, especially at Pompeii. And how can I possibly know that except for the representation on various mosaics? But well, how do we know frescoes? How do we know? we find all these peach pits everywhere? <laughs> yeah. So yeah, the Romans are eating them and they're spitting out those pits. Uh, so yes, they love they love their peaches. I love peaches too. So, you know, two of my favorite fruits are peaches and cherries. So uh, I, I probably do pretty well uh, in Pompeii because, you know, uh, no bananas, though. So, you know, I'd add that to the troop. But, oh, well, you can't have a complete fruit cocktail. But you can get a nice representation. And I like that. And so you could see, now you can see, right, just that alone would bring Romans to come here and to enjoy uh, all these different kinds of, of fruits. And so now before uh, uh, Vesuvius uh, erupted, uh, there was a few, there were, there were, there were a few signs. And the, the signs were a series of earthquakes. And some of these earthquakes were, were quite devastating, especially the one in 62 CE. Uh, and uh, it was a violent earthquake. And uh, there was even representations uh, in, 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 in a uh, carving of the earthquake happening. And we find also through various inscriptions, it was devastating. In fact, this, this uh, earthquake in 62 uh, CE was so devastating that uh, the earthquake damage was still being fixed by the time of 79 CE. So there were still uh, some destruction as a result of, of that earthquake. Okay, so uh, when the eruption happened was during the short reign of Flavius Titus, uh, who basically ruled during a very difficult time. He was an amazing emperor. Uh, I, I've done a talk on this already, but uh, I just want to mention that, uh, you know, people always talk about the bad emperors, and it kind of drives me crazy, because if they were all bad, you know, for so long, uh, there wouldn't be a Rome. And the, re the reality is, and I know you're going to be shocked, uh, the large portion of Roman emperors were actually pretty good. 
<laughs> and I can give you a long list of good emperors. And, you know, I would never say anything like that, going through a list like that, like, you know, <coughs> Claudius, excuse me. Uh, did I say anything? I didn't say Vespasian. Oh, yeah, look at Titus. Okay, I didn't say anything. Nerva, Trajan, you know, Adrian, Athenaeus, Pius, you know, uh, Marcus Aurelius. Oh, boy, I'm talking. <laughs> Are you getting my point? There's a lot of good emperors, and you can go all the way through. And Titus was definitely one of them. And we take a look here. Uh, during his time. Uh, and, um, and so it was very difficult. Now, Pliny uh, the Younger uh, provides a date, uh, being August 24th, 79 CE. And so this has been the popular date. Now, I'll be honest, I mean, everything's up for um, <clears throat> debate. And there is something that could say that it was that maybe Pliny, who the younger, who also was there, by a Pliny, uh, the elder and Pliny the younger were both there at the time, that he may have got the date wrong, or that uh, those who are copying the manuscript got the date wrong. So the reason why uh, is that there was this, a discovery in 2018. Uh, they were taking a look, uh, they found uh, something kind of interesting. They found uh, uh, a, uh, the wall of a villa that was being excavated uh, that uh, had an inscription uh, that read the 16th day before the first day of November in the Roman calendar, which is, of course, you know, October 17th. And this was done by somebody who was restoring a villa. Uh, and what he was doing uh, is, is that he was actually mocking uh, somebody uh, in this in this little cheeky uh, kind of graffiti uh, wrote a rude message uh, there, and um, what happened as a result is that uh, you know he's making this restoration, and then of course right after that uh, Vesuvius erupted. Well, that would place it in October. Does that make sense? I mean, we have a lot of information here, <laughs> you know. So you know, how can he be restoring something? Right? Are you following? After it has already happened. <laughs> so that's that's another interesting point. And the other part is is that when we take a look, there's there's uh, there's fresh pomegranates, evidence of fresh pomegranates, and pomegranates in this area are harvested uh, during the time of the autumn, as we know, and as popular knowledge at that time, and not during the summer. And so, so the idea of seeing uh, the fresh pomegranates is another sign, but it's not for sure. Maybe, you know, there's always exceptions, you know, maybe the guy doesn't know his dates. <laughs> okay. Uh, all right, moving right along. Dates, are you talking about fruits now? Another? No, 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 no. Okay, moving right along. So, uh, so it could be one of the two dates, but in a large point, is that it happened that year okay so okay so let's go through now we're gonna there when it comes to evidence about uh from various writers we have three ancient writers that talk about the eruption of mount vesuvius and what happened okay so suetonius uh he is one source uh suetonius is writing uh in the first part of the second century, but uh, his lifetime is still contemporaneous to the time of the eruption of Mount Vesuvius. Uh, he probably was a teenager in his 20s at the time it happened, so this is a good source. Uh, and he writes as follows. He says, Titus's reign was marked by a series of dreadful catastrophes, an eruption of Mount Vesuvius and Campania, a fire at Rome, which burned for three days and nights, and one of the worst outbreaks of the plague that have ever been known. Throughout this assortment of disasters, he showed far more than the emperor's concern. It resembled the deep love of a father for his children, which he conveyed not only in a series of comforting edicts, but by helping the victims to the utmost extent of his purse. And so you can see again, uh, you know, Titus is a good emperor. People love him. 
uh, in a tremendous way. Uh, another one is Cassius Dio. Cassius Dio, <laughs> uh, he writes a little bit later, uh, you know, going into uh, the third century, uh, even though part of his lifetime was the second century. So his information comes a little bit later, but it does come from earlier sources. But I gotta tell you, I'm not sure about the credibility of some of this. So I'm gonna go ahead uh, and read about it here. Uh, here he goes. Uh, he says, in Campania, remarkable and frightful occurrences took place. Uh, although I, I love his description of, of, the, of the eruption. For a great fire suddenly flared up at the very end of the summer. Now look at his timing, right? Uh, it happened on this wise. Mount Vesuvius stands over against Neapolis near the sea, and it has inexhaustible fountains of fire. Once it was equally high at all points, and the fire rose from the center of it. For here only have the fires broken out, whereas all the outer parts of the mountain remain even now untouched by fire. It's fascinating how a Roman describes a volcano, right? He continues, consequently, as the outside uh, is never burned, while the central part is constantly growing brittle and being reduced to ashes, the peaks surrounding the center retain their original height to this day. But the whole section that is on fire, having been consumed, has in the course of time settled and therefore became concave. Thus, the entire mountain resembles a hunting theater. <laughs> uh, if we may compare great things to small, uh, its outlying heights support both trees and vines in abundance, but the crater is given over to the fire and sends up smoke by day and a flame by night. Even here, you can tell, uh, you know, during the time of Cassius Dio, this is, it is a very active volcano after the eruption of 79, where you still see the evidence of it constantly smoking. So when Mount Vesuvius awoke, it stayed awake <laughs> and continued to burn uh, even a, 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 almost a couple centuries later. He says, in fact, it gives the impression that quantities of incense of all kinds are being burned in it. Interesting. This now goes on all the time, sometimes to a greater, sometimes to a less extent, but often the mountain throws up ashes whenever there is extensive settling in the interior and discharges stones whenever it is rent by violent blasts of the air. It also rumbles and roars because it vents are not all grouped together, but are narrow and concealed. So this is his impression of Mount Vesuvius. Uh, this, I mean, you could you remember Romans, uh, they see volcanoes connected to the underworld, right? There is a spiritual component to it. Uh, and you know, have Vulcan or Hespasius, right? Uh, who's connected to the forges of below. In fact, uh, he goes a little bit further, <laughs> maybe a little too far, uh, such as Vesuvius, and these phenomena usually occur there every year. But all the other occurrences that have taken place there in the course of time, however, notable because unusual, they have, they have seemed to those who on each occasion observed them, nevertheless would be regarded as trivial in comparison with what now happened, uh, even all have been combined into one. So he's going to go into now what happened uh, at Pompeii. This is what we felt. And you're thinking, okay, so we're going to hear an account, right? You know, an account of, of Mount Vesuvius erupting. I mean, this is obvious. He says, numbers of huge men, quite surpassing any human stature. What? Such creatures, in fact, as the giants are pictured to have been, appeared. Wait, what? <laughs> it's like tabloid time, right? Oh, well, wait, what? Appear now on the mountain, now in the surrounding uh, country, and again in the cities, wandering over the earth day and night, and also flitting through the air. It's like, wait, there's giants? So he's accompanying this eruption with the appearance of, of giants. Why would giants be roaming around during the time of the eruption of Mount Vesuvius? <laughs> well, those who are into Roman mythology, as well as Greek mythology, you know, you do have those giants of the underworld, and you have the Titans, 
right? So, so the idea is that these they're coming out <laughs> and they're they're going across the land. So, so in the Roman imagination, amongst all the and the, and the stone and the smoke and the gases and and the ash. Uh, apparently, they're envisioning monsters, giant men walking through. Isn't that scary, you know? And so you're thinking, well, why would that? Oh, maybe it's a good reason to stay indoors. Think about it. So superstitions would keep people indoors, and that, of course, would lead to their death. Think about this. Something because people don't realize that these uh, stories, which by the way are mentioned earlier, Pliny does talk about the fact that people are making up stories so we are now encountering one of these stories about these these great monsters after this fearful droughts and sudden violent earthquakes occurred so the whole plain round and sea and the summits leaped into the air there were frequent rumblings some of them subterranean that re resembled thunder and some on the surface that sounded like bellowings the sea also joined in the roar and the sky re-echoed it then suddenly a portentous crash was heard as if the mountains were tumbling into ruins and first huge stones were hurled aloft rising as high as the very summits then came a great quantity of fire and endless smoke so the whole atmosphere was obscured and the sun was entirely hidden as if eclipsed thus day was turned into night and light into darkness some thought the giants were rising again in revolt for as this time also many of their forms could be discerned in the smoke and moreover a sound of trumpets was heard which often others believe the whole universe was being resolved into chaos uh, and fire you know so we're hearing trumpet sounds of course you know there's a lot of uh, there's evidence that probably trumpets were being uh, sounded because you're going to have people who play the trumpets <laughs> in the area uh, trying to, you know, you know, bring people to help them. <laughs> you know, if you can't see something, you can hear something. So this is not completely hearsay. I think it's interesting. Therefore, they fled some from the houses into the streets, other from outside into the houses, now from the sea to the land, and now from the land to the sea. And you see this feeling of just complete confusion. Where are we supposed to go? Are we supposed to run and go inside? Are we supposed to go outside and flee to the ocean? And you're going to see this in the, in the next account. People are confused because there is no manual to tell us what to do under these kinds of circumstances well there is but uh, you know uh, it's it's kind of like uh, you guys remember uh what here in california uh you have the earthquake drills right and so it's like what do you do you know it's like go under your your desk right because you know if things start to fall you're safe but other people say well what you're supposed to do is you're supposed to run clear right i mean during an actual earthquake what did you do did you go under your desk you know, uh, you know, the earthquake, or did you, you get the, you, you ran out of there, didn't you? Right? You, right? Because human instinct goes both ways. And this is the same situation. Where, I don't know what we're supposed to do. We're caught. Right? Like 9 11. Like 9 11. People didn't know if it was a right. terrorist attack or where to go. 9 11, like a terrorist attack. Well, we, we don't know where to go. Right? That's a good point. Absolutely. So uh, it is a time of complete confusion. Uh, and in fact, uh, he goes on, he says, uh, while this is going on, an inconceivable quantity of ash was blown out, which covered both sea and land and filled all the air. It wrought much injury of various kinds, as chance befell to men and farms and cattle. In particular, it destroyed fish and birds. And furthermore, he continues, it buried two entire cities, Herculaneum and Pompeii. The latter place while its populace was seated in the theater. A theater that sat around 5,000 people. Can you imagine the pandemonium? I mean, you're all in the theater watching the performance and suddenly Mount Vesuvius erupts. What are you gonna do? How do you get out of there, right? You can imagine the panic. You know, you're not even at home. I mean, you know, 5,000, that's a lot of people. 
right? You're, you're gonna you're gonna run. What are you gonna run? And you're gonna try to go through those exits and down the streets and and you know where are your loved ones? So you can imagine people are gonna go. Well, I need to get my loved ones. Where are they? You know, in some cases they are from Pompeii. I'm sure some are from the nearby city. But this is a very scary moment, um, and you can see that. Indeed, the amount of dust taken altogether was so great, he says, that some of it reached Africa and Syria and Egypt, and it also reached Rome. I think it's kind of funny. It's like, it, it reached all these faraway places. It also reached Rome. It's like, well, Rome is right there, but anyway. Filling the air overhead with darkness uh, and darkening the sun. There, too, no little fear was occasioned that lasted for several days since the people did not know and could not imagine what happened. But like those close at hand, believed that the whole world was being turned upside down, that the sun was disappearing into the earth, and that the earth was being lifted to the sky. These ashes now did the Romans no great harm at the time, though later they brought a terrible pestilence upon them. So you're, you're having people saying, you know what? This is the end of the world. This is it. You know, and you can see from their perspective, it is the apocalypse, right? Because they don't see anywhere else. All they see is this mountain exploding, you know, and, you know, ash going through the earth, and their imaginations are taking flight. So, yeah, superstition is going to feed in there. And if we lived at that time, I know we think to ourselves, oh, giants, unbelievable, you know, but you, if you, you know, if you, Put yourself in their shoes within their faith system, within their belief system. Wouldn't you think that the gods are angry? You know, wouldn't you think that the earth is is at its end? Right? So you can you can understand where they're where they're where they're at. Okay, the final one, is, and I do want to go through these because I am painting a picture that's very important. You know, when you go to Pompeii, I want you to be or have been there, I want you to understand exactly what happened from the perspective of that time. And I, I think these eyewitnesses, well, in this case, Cassie Steele is getting this from eyewitnesses, but you can see this. And you, know, and you can see, obviously, there's a little telephone going on there. So you weren't safe inside. But you weren't safe inside, and you weren't safe outside. There's nowhere to go. And the best account, of course, here we go. It's, it's, now, it's lengthy, but I'll take my time. I'll describe each bit. So don't worry, because I want you to understand this. And if I get this accomplished, that's my goal. <laughs> because you know, then we'll go into all the details of the city, because we're going to actually take a walking tour through the city of Pompeii. So I know a lot of people will go, let's do topics. But I think, you know, it'll be interesting. We're going to start out uh, you know, at the Harbor Gate, and we're going to walk through and, and look at the various sites and what their significance is. I hope that that's what you want. But, uh, but I want to make sure that you understand what happened. And here we go. Pliny, uh, the younger, uh, who is the nephew of Pliny the elder, wrote a letter to his friend Cornelius Tacitus, who is the great historian. Uh, what happened, according to him, in late August of 79 uh, CE, when Vesuvius obliterated Pompeii and killed his uncle and almost destroyed his family. So this is the context. Now, it's interesting because we do have the writings of Cornelius Tacitus, the historian. We do. But uh, Cornelius Tacitus has a writing called the, the Annals, uh, which goes, you know, all the way, you know, uh, you know, focuses on Tiberius uh, and, of course, Gaius Caligula and Claudius uh, and Nero, and it's in parts. And, but we still have that. He wrote another work called The Histories. And the histories that we have from Tacitus uh, is the, basically starts around, you know, 68, 69 with Nero dying. And then it goes into the great civil war and the rise of Vespasian. And then we've lost everything else. We don't have anything else of his history. So, so which is interesting because Pliny wrote to fill in for Tacitus an eyewitness account for him to include in his histories in the year 79. Well, his history stops at 70. But it's really cool because we have discovered the letters of Pliny to Tacitus and his account. So while we don't have the history of Tacitus, we have the primary source of Pliny writing to Tacitus about what happened. And, and most likely, uh, Tacitus would have edited this 
and shorten it up uh, and had his own special perspective. So what's, what's really cool is we get every single detail of exactly what happened everything you know you know you know after, after going through this you know his uncle sneezed you think that maybe he wrote that down too <laughs> you know uh and uh so here we go okay so but we're going to go through and describe it so i'm not going to simply but here we go he goes as faults uh he says um uh, at that time, by the way, uh, Pliny was 18 years old. Uh, he was living in his uncle's villa in the town of Misnium, which is nearby. Uh, and uh, we pick up the story as he describes the warning raised by his mother. Uh, I've actually edited this. <laughs> so it's more. But here we go. He says, my uncle was stationed at Misnium, an active command of the fleet. On 24 August, in the early afternoon, my mother drew his attention to a cloud of unusual size and appearance. So there's this cloud that appears, you know, in the sky. Very unusual. Like maybe something was on fire, right? Uh, he, being the uncle, had been out in the sun. He had taken a cold bath and lunched while lying down. And then went back to working at his books. That's the uncle. Now, you know, Pliny the Elder is very famous for his natural history. Uh, uh, he was, uh, in a sense, a Renaissance man for that period of time, a Leonardo da Vinci of ancient Rome. And so he was, he was, he was a jack of all trades. He was into botany, he was, in, he was into uh, history, he was, he was into geology, he was into, I mean, he just, and you know, he, reading his work is like a cabinet of mysteries. Uh, there's so many different curious things that he, so, so his uncle is really diligent and his work does survive, so you can read it if you're interested. So Pliny the Elder, uh, he basically, he's had a nice day <laughs> so nice cold bath because you know a cold bath uh it, it, it was considered kind of uh, you know romans usually ended their time at the baths in general with a nice cold bath they believe it kind of sealed up all the cells you know you know at the very end so there you go it's good for you too he's, i'm sure he's conservative good, cold bath you know <laughs> none of that luxury stuff he called uh for his shoes the uncle and climbed up to a place which would give him the best view of the phenomenon. It was not clear at this distance from which mountain the cloud was rising. Uh, it, afterwards, he says to be Vesuvius. So he's seeing these, you know, not sure where the smoke is coming from. Its general appearance, this is great. Uh, I love uh, Pliny's. Its general appearance can be best expressed as being like an umbrella pine. For it rose to a great height on a sort of trunk and then split off into branches. You know, when you take a look at volcanic eruptions, it oftentimes doesn't look that way. It just kind of shoots straight into the air. And then all of a sudden, and then it, you know, and then it mushrooms out. You know, so he's describing this as a tree. And I think that's, that's, that's brilliant because he's seen this. This is how he remembers it, right? <clears throat> okay. So he continues, there too, no little fear was occasioned. Uh, the last uh, lasted for several days since the people did not know and could not imagine what had happened. But like those close at hand, believed that the whole world was being turned upside down. So you can see the correlation with Cassius Dio's account. You know, something is going on, right? That the sun was disappearing into the earth and that the earth was being uh, lifted, right? You can see this here. Uh, what happened is uh, its general appearance can be, he's, oh, sorry, uh, in places it looked white, elsewhere blotched and dirty according to the amount of soil and ashes carried with it. Okay, so then he continues. He says, my uncle's scholarly acumen so, you know, right away, you know, Pliny's going, the, the elder's going, you know, the uncle's like, all right, I want to see what this is. Let's, let's investigate. Because Pliny the elder, elder did actually investigate volcanoes. He loved volcanoes too. I just didn't know that one was a volcano, you know? It was hidden under this beautiful slope. Oh, it's so sad because you take a look at this image of Mount Vesuvius and you're seeing villas that go all the way up to the top. 
And can you imagine those poor people living at the top of Mount Vesuvius? They had no chance, right? You know, it's like, you know, it's a, they were literally, the villas were blown away, right? Uh, so um, he says, my uncle's scholarly acumen saw it at once that it was important enough for a closer inspection. And he ordered a boat to be made ready, telling me I could come with him if I wished. Don't go, plenty the younger. <laughs> Don't go. You can come with me to investigate. He's all, <laughs> but he, he's all, he, I replied that I prefer to go with my studies. And as it happened, he had himself given me some writings to do. Okay. So never say that scholarship doesn't save anybody. <laughs> Right, you know, saved by homework. Right, you know, thank you for giving me homework to do. It saved my life. See, okay, because Pliny uh, the Elder was also teaching uh, Pliny the Younger. Uh, as he was leaving the house, he was handed a message from Rectina, the wife of Toscus, whose house was at the foot of the mountain, so that escape was impossible except by boat. So there's no way to get out, uh, no way to get out by land. They're at the foot of the mountain. If you know the geography of the area, it still descends right to the water. So the escape should be by sea. She was terrified by the danger, threatening her, and implored him to rescue her from her fate. So he changed his plans. And what he had begun in the spirit of inquiry he completed as a hero. He gave orders for the warships to be launched and went on board himself with the intention of bringing help to many more people besides Rectina, for this lovely stretch of coast was thickly populated. There are people, I mean, this again, as I said, was the breadbasket. This was the summer retreat. And if Pliny is right, and it is August, and by the way, August in Rome was super hot. Nobody wanted to be there. And that means the, many of senators and other types would go to uh, uh, Pompeii and Herculean and these other seaside cities to get relief uh, from Rome. Rome was terrible in August. If this happened in August, there's a lot of people there. So not only do you have a local population, you have all these tourists and visitors there. It's the worst time. It is. Yes, Terry. I have a question. Yes, if question. If a message can be got to Pliny the Elder, yes. then couldn't that um, woman have escaped in the same manner? It came through, yeah, probably most likely came through. Uh, couldn't she escape if the message, message came? That was the question. And, you know, it looks like this is going through a military courier service. Uh, so the answer is it would be difficult. And, and we're going to see that in a few moments. But yes, good question. Absolutely. So yeah, I think you have a message can get through. And hey, you know, how in the world, uh, uh, then why couldn't she go with the message? Right? You know, but again, uh, Pliny is in a, uh, in a military position. So, uh, you know, it's a, there's a different kind of network, if that makes sense between that and the civilian. Uh, yeah, for moving trying to escape by Pony Express. Yeah, escaping by Pony Express would be a good example of that. Yeah, it's, it's a little more difficult, right? So what happens is that um, he hurried to the place which everyone else was hastily leaving, so people are leaving, steering his course straight for the danger zone. He was entirely fearless. Oh, Pliny loves his uncle. <laughs> Come on, you can see this, he's entirely fearless. It's like, when you read parts of this, though, you'll say, what, fearless, what is he doing? But anyway, entirely fearless, fearless, uh, fearless describing each new movement and phase of the portent to be noted down exactly as he observed them. Well, what does that mean? That means he's got somebody there. He's either he's, he is writing himself, and then when he's not writing, somebody else is taking notes. Uh, so he's a scholar. It's like, take notes of this. And those notes survived. So that got back, even though Pliny the Elder did not. His notes got back. Hey, you know, save, you know, this, these observations must, must be saved. Okay, ashes were already falling, hotter and thicker as the ships drew near, followed by bits of pumice and blackened stones charred and cracked by the flames. Then suddenly they were in shallow water, and the shore was blocked by the debris from the mountains. 
It's like, oh no. So again, remember the entire top of Mount Vesuvius blew off. This debris went somewhere and it went into the sea. For a moment, my uncle wondered whether to turn back. But when the helmsman advised that he refused, telling him that fortune stood by the courageous and they must make for Pompeianus at Stebe, which is near Pompeii. He was cut off there by the breadth of the bay, for the shore gradually curves around a basin filled by the sea, so that he was not as yet in danger, though it was clear that this would come near as it spread. Pompeianus had, this is the man, therefore already put his belongings on board the ship, intending to escape if the contrary wind fell. So it's like, wait, what's going on here? Now, I want you to understand this. There's a contrary wind going on. They can't safely go out. People are always going, how in the world? I mean, you know, get out by, 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 by sailing vessel, you know, boats, get out of there. Well, you know, if the current is against you and the wind is going the opposite way, you are not going anywhere, right? You are stuck there. And, and, and I've heard people complain about this. It's like, well, if you, I guess you don't know how, you know, uh, sailing works. I have been sailing. I have sailed before. <laughs> uh, and if the wind is going the opposite way, you're not going, you know, it's really strong. It's pretty darn hard to do anything else. You know, you're stuck, right? So this, okay, so um, now, so he's stuck there. He's holding on. Now, what happened, though, is the, while the wind is blowing the opposite way, they can't get out. Now, you see the problem. It continues. This wind was, of course, full in my uncle's favor because he's arriving. Got it? So he's going there. And so from that perspective, it's easier to get there. It's going to be difficult to get out. So, And he was able to bring his ship in. He embraced his terrified friend, cheered and encouraged him, and thinking he could calm his fears by showing his own uh, composure, gave orders that he was to be carried to the bathroom. I told you it's detailed. <laughs> After his bath, he laid down and dined. He was quite cheerful, or at any rate, he pretended he was, which was no less courageous. So he's, he's arriving there. They're all stuck there, right? They can't get out. The wind is going contrary uh, to getting out. And you got, you know, you got part of the bay being covered by debris. It's not a good situation. And so, so Pliny's sitting there going, hey, you know, you know there's nothing we can do. Uh, let's, uh, take a bath. He's, he's a very clean guy, right? Uh, <laughs> take a bath, you know, um, enjoy, uh, you know, enjoy a, a meal. Be cheerful. Meanwhile, on Mount Vesuvius, broad sheets of fire and leaping flames blazed at several points. Their bright glare emphasized by the darkness of night. My uncle tried to allay the fears of his companions by repeatedly declaring that these were nothing but bonfires left by the peasants in their terror, or else empty houses on fire in the districts they had abandoned. So you see these licks of flame all over the place, as opposed to thinking it's volcanic, you know, you know, you say, well, these, you know, these are bonfires, people who are survivors, you know, trying to get out. And they're, yeah, okay. But you see a lot of hearsay being here. Then he went to rest and certainly slept. For as he was a stout man, his breathing was rather loud and heavy and could be heard by people coming and going outside of his door. He snores. <laughs> right, did, I, did I tell you this is a detailed report of what happened? Okay, I'm not kidding, right? By this time, the courtyard, giving access to his room, was full of ashes mixed with pumice stones so that the, its level had risen. Now, this is getting terrible. This is terrifying. Meanwhile, as he's, you know, resting, because again, they're still stuck, right? They're still stuck there. But, you know, the idea is wait and see, you know, hope that the winds will go the right way because I was able to get here. Now we need to get out. but um it's not happening so he's having he's having to wait and meanwhile the ash is starting to rise up outside Ooh, right and if he had stayed in the room any longer he would never have gotten out he was wakened came out and joined Papaneus and the rest of the household who had sat up all night can you imagine just sitting there now it's sad to say that in Pompeii today we have the remnants of many of these families who were staying 
inside waiting for this thing to end. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, we have, you know, seen what they look like, entire families, uh, you know, and we know that through the plaster casting, you know, so that uh, left, a, a, you know, what they look like. In, a, in other cases, skeletons, depends. Depends on the heat. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, so they wake it up. They debated whether to stay indoors or to take their chances in the open. Kind of sounds like Cassius Theo, doesn't it? Do we go inside? Do we stay inside? Do we go outside? For the buildings were now shaking with violent shocks and seemed to be swaying to and fro as if they were torn from their foundations. Uh, we have to realize that, you know, with an eruption like this, you're going to get these strange winds, these flurries that blow. People don't realize that. And uh, yeah, so it will feel like an earthquake in many cases. Isn't this terrifying? You know, <laughs> everything's shaking. Outside, on the other hand, there was a danger of failing puma, uh, falling puma stones, excuse me, even though these were light and porous. However, after comparing the risks, they chose the latter. In my uncle's case, one reason outweighed the other, but for the others, it was a choice of fears. As a protection against falling objects, they put pillows on their heads and tied them down with cloths. So, so they're putting pillows uh, to protect themselves. Elsewhere, there was daylight by this time, but they were still in darkness, blacker and denser than any ordinary night, which they relieved uh, by lighting torches of various kinds of lamps. So the night, so the, so the day has turned into night. My uncle decided to go down to the shore and investigate on the spot the possibility of any escape by sea. But he found the waves still wild and dangerous. So now you're going to have the tides, you know, you, you can't, you know, it's, it's, you can't win, right? I mean, you are, you are trapped. He says, um, a sheet was spread on the ground for him to lie down. And he reportedly asked for cold water to drink. So uh, there we go. And then, then the flames and smell of sulfur, which gave warning of the approaching fire, drove the others to take flight. So now you're going to have the fire arriving, right? And roused him to stand up. He stood up, leaned on two slaves, and then suddenly he collapsed. I imagine because the dense fumes choked his breathing by blocking his windpipe, which was constitutionally weak and narrow and often inflamed. When daylight returned on the 26th, two days after the last day he had been seen, his body was found intact and uninjured, still fully clothed and looking more like sleep than death. And that was his end. So, but apparently they did escape. You know, apparently, you know, you know the winds uh, went the right direction and, and at least some got out to tell the story, right? Some got out, but unfortunately, Pliny didn't, didn't survive. We have one more account. It's like, so you could, what had basically happened is Tasha, so this is going, this is great. Yeah, I, I like this. This is great. This would be great in my history. What about you? <laughs> you were there, you know, tell us your story. So in a sense, we actually have two different accounts. It's a separate letter. It's all different, right? And so he described what happened to him and his mother uh, during the second day of the disaster. He says, ashes were already falling. He says, not as, not as yet very thickly. I looked around, a dense black cloud was coming up behind us, spreading over the earth like a flood. Uh, uh, he, he says, uh, let us leave the road while we can still see, I said, or we shall be knocked down and trampled underfoot in the dark by the crowd behind. Okay, so now we have another interesting situation, right? So let's get out before what? The crowds, right? People are fleeing. Let's get out before we're going to be trampled. We scarcely sat down to rest when darkness fell, not the darkness of a moonless or cloudy night, but as if the lamp have been put out in a closed room. Complete darkness. Now, this is where it gets pretty upsetting. You could hear, so they're stuck there. You could hear the shrieks of women, the wailing of infants, and the shouting of men. Some were calling their parents, others, their children, or their wives, trying to recognize them by their voices. People bewailed their fate or that of their relatives, and there were some who prayed for death in their terror of dying. 
Many besought the aid of the gods, but still more imagined there were no gods left and that the universe was plunged into eternal darkness forevermore. People have lost hope. I mean, you can see it. You can, you can, you can feel it. You know, I mean, he was there, you know. And again, yeah, it reminds me of, of 9-11. It reminds me of these the hurricane disasters. It reminds me of any great catastrophe where the human factors weighed in. I mean, we can take a look uh, at the, at the at, you know, the, 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 the clay images of, the, uh, of of those in Pompeii or the skeletons or, or in Herculean or Stave in other places. And, you know, we sometimes have this distant feel to it because it happened so long ago. We lose the human factor uh, just by the study of it. And we just see it's a body. It's a body there. But these are humans that are suffering. These are humans that know that death is at hand. And this is, this is, this is terrifying. There were people, too, who added to the real perils by inventing fictitious dangers. Did I mention that? Right? And some of these got in uh, to Dio's account of the giants, right? Some reported that part of Mission had collapsed or another part was on fire, and through their tales were, falsely, or, or were false, they found others to believe them. Um, by the way, I want to bring that up. Uh, people are making up stories. There's hearsay. And people are susceptible. When a disaster happens, I know that none of us can connect to this idea uh, when a disaster happens that you're going to get a lot of hearsay, you're going to get a lot of false information, or lots of rumors. Okay, we can, right? This happened then. You know, people are making up stories and people are so afraid of their, you know, for their lives that, that they're going to believe it, believe anything. They're susceptible. They're open to these suggestions. Now, even like giants, you know, coming out of the crater. He saw a gleam of light return, and we took this to be a warning of the approaching flames rather than daylight. Oh, yikes. So, so there's like, oh, look, there's light. It's like, no, it's a light of flames that's illuminating the sky, right? Uh, but uh, he says, uh, however, the flames remained some distance off. Then darkness came on once more. And the ashes began to fall again, this time in heavy showers. So it's, this is going to get worse, right? He had a reprieve, and then we rose from time to time and shook them off. Otherwise, we should have been buried and crushed beneath their weight. I could boast that not a groan or cry of fear escaped me in these perils. But I admit that I was derived, that, that I derived some poor consolation in my moral lot from the belief that the whole world was dying with me and I with it. So now we're having the idea, it's like, he's not, he's not panicked because he feels, he doesn't feel alone. We're all dying. We're all going to die. And he, I know it's very strange again. He's drawing comfort that he doesn't want to die alone. I think that's, uh, many of us have that perspective, you know, if there's a great catastrophe happening, the worst part is to feel like you're isolated right, by yourself. But if you are there with other people who are sharing the same catastrophe together, then there is some comfort that, hey, you know, uh, we're all fearing, we're, you know, it's about, you know we're, we're all in fear together, you know. So, so there you have it. Um, so that's his, uh, that, that's his account, you know, that's, that's the account of Pliny the Younger. It's pretty good, right? Uh, if you want something detailed, you got it, right? You know, and of course, we have mentioned by Suetonius uh, how um, Titus, the emperor, responded to this. Uh, he set up, he says, a board of ex-consuls chosen by late, lot, lot, excuse me, to relieve distress in Campania uh, and, de and devoted the property of those who died in the eruption and left no heirs to fund for rebuilding the stricken cities. So if you're, you know, so those who have died, you take that, you take that property and you, you sell it, if it survived, and use that. It's a shrewd. It's a shrewd way of, of trying to pay for things. His only, and of course, uh, he also stripped his own country mansions of their decorations, distributed these amongst the public buildings and temples. And he used, again, he's a great emperor. So he's doing his best to help people out. Uh, and, of course, there was a great, you know, he, right after after Vesuvius, there was a great fire in Rome that lasted for three days. Uh, and uh, it, uh, it was terrible. 
uh, and it destroyed much of the center of the city. It's not a good time. <laughs> it's not a good time. I mean, it seems like all these bad things are happening. And again, I think we all can relate. It's like, it's not one thing, it's the other. And this, they're having this moment. But I, I don't want to be go there too much, but I think there's a difference though, is that is that how they handled it was 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 better than many cases how we handle our situation but you know does it make sense the idea is is that there was so much support there was an agreement uh people were helping each other uh you have you have a lot of people uh you don't have reports of people uh you know not caring or or just say ah that's just them you have people who did care uh and uh you had an immediate response uh, by the government uh to help out and to relieve those so you know kudos to titus uh and others to do his best where in many cases he's he you know campanella is so much as destroy he's fighting that uh the center of rome is burned down he's dealing with that and on top of that one of the worst plagues he's dealing with so plague we can we can we can identify with that plague is spreading and he's doing his best uh to help everybody else and they are helping each other, as we know from other reports of Rome and the pestilence. We know that there is a lot of people uh, trying to help one another. Okay, now let's go into some of the science. How do they die? You know, for those who lived in Pompeii and the surrounding towns, heat was the main source of death of people. Previously, uh, they believed to have died by ash suffocation. Now. You do have that evidence of that ash suffocation. I mean, ash suffocation. That would be Pliny the Elder, right? Clearly, you know. But he was the primary one. Okay, how they lost their lives. You see, uh, a study done in 2010 uh, shows that the ex there was an exposure at certain points at hot. They're called hot surges. Uh, these these are pyroclastic flows, uh, and these hot surges were 250 Celsius or 482 degrees. So you don't have a chance. It just, whoo, and what it does is it burns your whole body. In some cases, there is no skeleton, right? It is consumed. Does that make sense? And hence it pop in other places. You have people, you know, pouring the molds into these empty hollows because these people are just burned, you know, pretty quickly. But still enough other outer aspect to hold on to the ash. That's a whole other bit how that works, right? So this is so. But still, people did die of other ways. I mean, you can imagine, right? Um, taking a look, uh, we take a look also at uh, uh, other bits and pieces. Uh, but we know that uh, there was um, uh, uh, a, a guy in 1864. Uh, his name is Fiorelli. Uh, made a startling discovery. He knew that the ash that covered Pompeii's uh, victims hardened around the fallen bodies and other organic uh, things. And so what he did is he poured liquid plaster into the cavity. He let the plaster harden. He then broke away their lava around, uh, around the plaster, leaving a cast or figure exactly how they died. Uh, you know, so we see them at the moment of death. Now, again, I want to mention going, yes, so some bodies did remain in many cases because you have a plaster situation, but many don't. Think about this. So many people die where are their bodies, we now know where the bodies went. They're burned in the instant, right? Consumed by the fire. Okay, now let's take a look. We now, but we do have bodies, right? Uh, and so we do have some, again, in many cases, we do have skeletons. In many cases, we don't have skeletons. So it really, it depends. But take a look at the skeletons that we do have. We have done some DNA evidence and worked on that. And taking a look at this, we realize uh, that, um, well, uh, as far as women and men, it was a one-to-one -one ratio. They discovered as many men and women at the site. So, so it's equal in that sense. The average age of death of an adult in Pompeii was about 40 years. So most of those who are dying were, were at least a 40 years of age. Okay, that's, that's, the, that's the, the general estimate. Now, isn't that a little higher than you would expect? You know, what about this whole thing about, you know, hey, people's lifespan uh, goes, you know, to their 30s and they just die. And yet, if we take a look at the ratio you know, the, the various numbers, the, the medium is that most people at the moment they died 
uh, happen to be around 40 years of age. So that tells you that people are living a little longer than we know. And we see that also on the tombstones from that era. Uh, the reality is, and people don't know this, but and people always argue, you know, well, the Romans, they had short lifespans. Is that true? Yes, it is. But it depends on when you're asking. So if you're asking the first century, no, they live longer. If you're asking the second century, no, they live longer up until the time of Marcus Aurelius and the pestilence and plagues. And then they live shorter lives uh, during the 200s. In the 300s, the lifespan goes up again. And then uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the 400s, uh, it goes down again. <laughs> so it, it's never consistent. So we got to be very careful about making generalizations. But it looks like from this, looking at the actual evidence, that people live a little bit longer. They said that there was a sizable group of individuals, get this, older than 60 years in Pompeii. Older than 60 years of age in Pompeii. So you're going to have a lot of older people there. Now, we'll talk about why some of these factors. Yet, now this is what's fascinating, young males seem to be not part of that equation. Not a lot of young males. You're thinking, how does this work? Why well, have all the young males? They escaped. <laughs> you know, they're younger, they're stronger, right? So they got they got the heck out of there, right? Now that also helps explain why there's a lot of older people there, right? Because they're not, you know, uh, as fast to get out, right? So so we have to take that under consideration. So while there is evidence that people do live longer, I mean, in the sixties and. The other evidence is, is that those can make it. <laughs> you know, they got, they're the ones who got trapped there while the young males, you also say young males, not young females. So unfortunately, we do have representation, as you know, if you've been to Pompeii, lots of young females were, were stuck there, uh, in many cases, uh, taking care of parents, taking care of family, which we also see within the material culture. Is that making sense? So there's there's that role, there's that duty. I mean, I'm sure you know they could get out, yeah, but, but you know, but again, there's there's these family connections. But the young men, uh, apparently, they escape. I think it's fascinating to have all this evidence, though, right? That we know so much by taking a look uh, at this, uh, taking a look at also what they look like or how they, you know, uh, you know, we found that um, uh, that. Um, oh, I want to mention one more thing uh, that. Um, we, we assume that half the population were children, but uh, we don't have that many children. So we have some. So again, uh, the question is, you know, are the young men running with the children? You know, to get them out. And, it, and there is the idea of women and children first, but in this case, it looks like children are first because uh, they want to save their patrimony. They want to save their, their offspring. They keep the line going on there, okay? Uh, the, the way, you know, we take a look here also, and we see that... Um, uh, that people suffer from arthritis. Uh, they had bloodborne infections and various diseases during childhood. Uh, but uh, you've seen that. And there is, um, uh, there is some degree uh, of, of teeth de degeneration, but not a lot. What I'm saying by that is they're not eating uh, artificial sugar. So their teeth are actually better than our teeth. Uh, their teeth are better preserved. So they have less cavities. You know, I know, again, we're picturing, you know, hey, you know, pulling out teeth, and they're all, you know, you see a Roman, they're missing all these teeth. Uh, Romans, you know, like, like uh, you, know, uh, uh, you know, juvenile and others, they actually make fun of people who are missing their teeth because so many people retain their teeth until old age. When sugar gets introduced, I'm not making I'm not on the podium because I like sugary things. So uh, when sugar is introduced, unfortunately, that's where, that's where all the teeth situation happens. It's how people eat. But anyway, so you're seeing healthy teeth. At least you have that. Okay, so now um, what happens is that, well, Pompeii is forgotten. In 1594, uh, Pompeii was almost <laughs> rediscovered by accident. There was a workman uh, that was uh, digging an underground channel to bring water from the Sarno River uh, to uh, a rich man's villa. And he did come across uh, some ancient ruins. That happened to be Pompeii. Uh, they, they even found uh, an inscription that said, Decurio Pompeius. Well, yeah, this is 1594. Okay, so 
And they, they apparently they didn't take a clue. So they're going up. And so Pompey remained forgotten. Then what happened is in 1709 to 1711, they discovered another nearby city called Herculaneum. Uh, and what happens is somebody was digging a well and they ran into uh, part of the Herculaneum theater. And they dug a, a, a deep tunnel down there and ooh, they found treasure. This is pretty exciting. And so miners and soldiers and convicts under Charles uh, the first, first uh, uh, the kingdom of Naples and Sicily, uh, did a treasure hunt at Herculaneum, uh, as you know, finding hundreds of sculptures, which were literally hacked from the walls uh, to be taken away as, as treasures, as booty, uh, to fill up their palaces, and, which is really a shame. So we did lose a lot at that point in 1740. Uh, now we have actually Pompeii being discovered. Uh, but, uh, you know, and uh, at this point uh, in 1750, a guy by the name of Carl Weber, a Weber, a Swiss army engineer, directs the excavations and he starts creating a systematic digs of Pompeii. And as a result, as soon as they discover the Temple of Isis, uh, in 1765, they're you know what? Forget uh, Herculaneum. They stop excavating Herculaneum because they're so in, 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 intrigued by this, this temple of Isis. And so now they go full on excavating uh, Pompeii, but uh, it is a little bit more systematic, which is as, as, as opposed to being haphazard with Herculaneum. Uh, this is, they discovered, of course, the famous Alexander the Great Mosaic. You've probably seen this image. Uh, that was discovered in 1830. Uh, then, of course, 1860s, you have an archaeologist by the name of Giuseppe Forali, right, who came up with the idea of, of filling in the hollows, the cast models. So that was during the 18, 1860s. That's pretty progressive, right? Uh, then what happened, as we're moving through this, is that uh, uh, for a while, uh, excavation stopped. And then uh, we have World War II. And unfortunately, in World War II, you know what happened is, well, I mean, you know, the Americans bombed her, uh, Pompeii. Did you guys know that? It's like, yeah, it's like, because, oh. you know, they're, they're, they're thinking that, well, uh, they're thinking that, that there could be munitions hidden there. And so, hey, you know, um, you know, it may be hidden in those buildings because, you know, nobody's going to destroy a historical site, you know. And by the way, there was no munitions. But anyway, so they did destroy uh, you guys didn't know that, right? <laughs> so, so uh, what happened is from uh, from the you know the 1940s to the 1960s, uh, they were they were fixing up Pompeii again, rebuilding uh, from the destruction that happened uh, during World War II. Surprise, huh? Yeah. Then, if that's not bad enough, in 1980, I remember when this happened. There was a severe earthquake that also destroyed parts of, of Pompeii. So, I mean, it's faced disasters even after Vesuvius. Finally, and a little late, 1997, Pompeii Herculaneum uh, became uh, declared World Heritage Sites uh, by UNESCO. 1997, again, I kind of have a problem with how long this took. Let's preserve this place in a proper manner as a world treasure. Well, I mean, most of you, you know, looking at this are probably already born uh, in 1997. Some of you haven't, but still pretty recent. Uh, the National Archaeological Museum in Naples opened a new wing in 2010, display paintings uh, from the site. Uh, then, of course, in also late 2010, torrential rains reduced to rubble. Two houses in Pompeii that have been rebuilt after World War II. So it's like a double disaster. Uh, but since uh, 2011, uh, they're, they've been doing much needed archaeological work uh, to, uh, to maintain it. And uh, discoveries are being made all the time, uh, especially recently. What will happen is this. Uh, it's a very strange kind of project, and it really came... Came about in 2015, they really started it out. And that is, you know, going over systematically places they have already excavated, but not completely. So, yes, they're going to new areas, but there's areas that, you know, in the 19th century, early 20th century, people are not very careful. Maybe we should examine carefully, you know, step by step, because some of these areas, if you've been there, are overgrown again. 
right? You know, it's just hard. And so let's let's clear it out again and be more systematic. And, and a lot of these exciting discoveries, which I'll mention at the very end, have been ha have happened or occurred in areas that they've already been. Uh, so yeah, so there it goes. Um, also, numerous graffiti have been found. And I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to read some of the graffiti, if you don't mind. Uh, so it really does give us an insight uh, into uh, life at that time. Um, I'm hoping I can go over. Is that okay in time? Okay, so I want to kind of go through some of this. But uh, I think that, uh, of course, we started late. So what happens is uh, you have a few here uh, that, um, uh, of course, some of these I can't read because they're, they're pretty uh, spicy, I guess the word for it. But there's at the bar of Prima, there's a story of uh, Sacesis, Severus, and, I and Iris, and it's played out on the war wall of a bar. So Severus, he writes, Sacesis, a weaver, loves the innkeeper's slave daughter named Iris. She, however, does not love him. Still, he begs her to have pity on him. His rival wrote this. Goodbye. Now, successes scrawls underneath this, says, envious one, why do you get in the way? Submit to a handsomer man and one who is being treated very wrongly and good looking. Scribbled under that, uh, Severus writes, I have spoken. I have written all there is to say. You love Iris, but she does not love you. <laughs> so, so you have this, this little banter going on at this bar. You just, you know, uh, and I, I love that. Uh, you have another one uh, here. Uh, <clears throat> see, um, oh, one here uh, at the house of Pescus says, to the one defecating here, beware of the curse. If you look down on this curse, may you have an angry Jupiter for an enemy. Ooh. Um, this one's weird. Theophilus, don't perform oral sex on girls against the city wall like a dog. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> uh, you got some of these that are really, you know, uh, uh, traveler, you eat bread and pape, but you get, you go to Nicaria for to drink, and Nicaria, the drinking is better. Hey, so you got nice, nice recommendation there. Um, uh, one says, whoever loves, let him flourish. Let him perish who knows not love. Let him perish twice over whoever forbids love. Oh, yeah, okay, that's kind of interesting. Um, oh, this guy, this guy, this frustration here. Defecator, may everything turn out okay so that you can leave this place. <laughs> you know, it's like, okay. Uh, you know, um, oh, even have this uh, the city block of the Aripoli in the possession of Gnaeus, Elias, Nagidius, Maeus is available to rent. From July first, don't rent. Right uh, there uh, are shops on the first floor, upper stories, high class rooms in a house. A person interested in renting this property should contact Primus, the slave Gnaeus, Elias, Nigidius, Maius. You know, this is July, right? July first. Can you imagine? Because this happened in August. Can you imagine? I'm sure he got a response, right? But uh, they're just like us, aren't they? Right? You know, your renters and. You know, and uh, life is as usual, right? Okay. Uh, hey, we're still laughing about the other one. There's actually more of those, but I want to read them because they're bad. <laughs> um, but anyway, oh, you know, what a lot of tricks you use to deceive an in deceive innkeeper. You sell water but drink unmixed wine. Uh, so basically, this is happening uh, at the shop of uh, Poteus. I'm still getting him bad press to this day. And basically, uh, he's serving watered down wine. You know, and uh, it's it's just like drinking water. Meanwhile, well, he's drinking the good stuff uh, for himself. Uh, so, oh, if anyone does not believe in Venus, they should gaze at my girlfriend. <laughs> wow. Yes. It, oh, I don't want to sell my husband, not for all the gold in the world. Oh. Wow. You know, there's lots of these. Uh, we have wet bed. Oh, we have wet. This is, this is done. <laughs> this is done at a uh, in the end. We have wet the bed, host. I confess we have done wrong. If you want to know why, there was no chamber pot. <laughs> so they're just they're just holding on to it. I just, they're just wet the bed. There's no place to go, uh, and we'll stop with this one. Uh, and I'll go into the the little walk here. If you felt the fire of love, mule driver, 
uh, you would make more haste to see Venus. I love a charming boy. I ask you, go the mules, let's go. Take me to Pompeii where love is sweet, you are mine. So obviously, when it comes to Roman society, uh, homosexuality is just part of life. You see this uh, throughout all the inscriptions. There's love for both uh, men to men, women to women, uh, not so much. Uh, in, the, in the material culture, uh, but you'll see men to men, and of course, obviously, uh, uh, women uh, to men and men to women, but mostly men to women. <laughs> so they're not scrolling as much. Okay, so moving on. So let's uh, let's let's kind of go there. I know this will be a longer talk, but uh, I want to make sure that you get an idea as we go through here. So when Wise and Pompeii, the visitor often uh, enters by way of the Porta Marina Gate. Uh, this is um, uh, this is the the, the sea wide uh, sea word entrance. This is how, you know how you enter. There's a bench outside the marine gate uh, with with some graffiti on it. it. Says if anyone sits here, let him read this first of all. If anyone wants a screw, he should look for Atis. She costs four sesterci. <laughs> so 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 there you have it. So you know you're sitting there. There's a bench there. There's graffiti. And there is, like a, I guess, a sales suggestion right there with a the price. Uh, once again, it's interesting to study that uh, and the role of prostitution uh, in ancient Rome. That's just kind of unpacking different questions. Heading northeast, one passes uh, with the Temple of Venus on uh, the right. Uh, it's interesting because the Temple of Venus, this was the patron, this is the uh, patron goddess of Pompeii. So, uh, so you got to think to yourself, Pompeii is a place where there is definitely lots of love going on. I mean, lots of, I mean, there's lots of brothels, there's lots of graffiti referring to this. You know, some people who are on holiday, what do they want to do? They want to hook up or through prostitution. But uh, you're going to still have the context of Venus, who is this goddess of love, who's overseeing these uh, uh, erotic mysteries, so to speak. So it does kind of make makes sense it was a very uh prominent temple uh it was built by Sulla, uh, but it was still undergoing reconstruction because of guess what that earthquake back in 62 when uh it, 79 hit they still hadn't finished uh fixing it all up uh so but you know we, we see throughout pompeii images of venus or as you from the greek perspective aphrodite uh, there's the famous scene painted in the peristyle house of venus for example where the goddess enthroned is on a large shell with a blue sea in the background you remember you know, some of these are classic images uh pompeii but but the, but the venus here uh is, is she's very she's very woman and seems to have earlier oscan uh attributes that means that uh that she is probably connected to uh, an indigenous italian god or goddess i should say of love so we have this temple of venus then we have the suburban baths the suburban baths if you have you had a chance to see the suburban baths it's pretty interesting maybe a little too interesting first of all there is a controversy it uh is it shared is it shared by both men and women or uh did they take turns and you know using this bath because the facilities reveal that it was it was used by both genders so both women and men shared uh, together this particular bath and it looks to me now you're going, well it must be taking turns because you're thinking you know a conservative traditionalist right yeah but unfortunately you can't do that uh because there are baths in further in Pompeii that we know were used at different times for men and women. And we also know that they were also there's there's two different separate accommodations, one section for men and one section for women. But the suburban baths is not that. It looks like it may have been used by the same together. And there was lots of reasons for that, but at the same time, we find evidence even throughout the second century where you have co-ed ba bathing together. Uh, even in the small towns. And then that stops when we get to the 200s. So it is a reality. Uh, you know, one thing about the Romans is they write a lot and they write everything down. And it's not like we're doing guesswork on this. They have told us so. And we also have emperors going, let's stop doing this. <laughs> and we have emperors who say, hey, let's keep it going. So this is not guesswork. Is it got it? But the suburban baths look like uh, they were co ed. 
as opposed to the ones that are inside the walls. Got it? Now we're taking a look at these baths uh, and uh, uh, there's one set of dressing rooms, right? There's one set there. And um, there's some erotic wall paintings, just a few of them, okay? Uh, and they are placed over what looks like lockers or places where you put your clothes. Uh, you take a look, and it's, it's explicit sex scenes, uh, group sex, oral sex, uh, and other ways like that. It's very erotic. And so many people will say, that these are, you know, since there's no numbers, this is the way to remember where you put your clothes. <laughs> it's like you put your clothes here and say, well, you're not going to forget. I am under this <laughs> image and I'm not going to forget that, you know, and you're not. You're not going to forget where you put your clothes. Other people, which I don't think uh, is correct, is that there's supposed to be advertisements for what's going on on the boat. Yeah, I don't think so. It doesn't make any sense to me. It's like, why advertise, especially since the permanent nature of these? I don't see why that would be an advertisement for a brothel. There are lots of brothels in, in Pompeii, but I think it's more likely uh, the idea of association, especially the way it looks uh, in connection to the various boxes, so to speak. Okay. Then we go from there. We enter, and there's a temple of Apollo. A temple of Apollo uh, was uh, pretty prominent. It was on a big uh, podium. Uh, and they even had a, 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 a uh, representation of the World Naval, modeled on the one located in the famous sanctuary of Apollo in Delphi. Uh, so Apollo was very important. It is a very uh, ancient temple. I mean, it stands, uh, it goes back, I mean, Apollo was worshipped quite a bit as early as the 6th century uh, BCE. This particular temple uh, dates from the 6th century sorry, the second century BCE, but probably has earlier roots. Uh, and then, of course, there's some interesting things there. You know, you're going to have, um, uh, they discovered two bronze statues inside the sacred precinct uh, with uh, Apollo with a bow and Diana to the, to the left of it. Uh, and these can be seen at the museum. Uh, we do know a lot about the festivities uh, dedicated to Apollo uh, in uh, Pompeii. Uh, so we have inscriptions that tell us exactly how it operated. Uh, so we find this uh, according to the epitaph, epitaph of Alias Claudius Flaccus. Uh, so what happens is that uh, it starts out and you have bullfighters, boxers, and pantomimes. And then you have this procession following them. And then you have the priests with officials of various sorts. And then you have clubs and represent, uh, representatives of particular trades, and they paraded through the streets. And what's interesting is that uh, they discovered uh, uh, images where the various trades would hold banners on two poles that talked about their trades and surrounded with garlands. Uh, and so, they, they, so as, they, as they're going through this procession, they show they hold these banners up. Yeah, interesting. And, and, and it would be connections to their trade, like the Fullers, with the various gods uh, and goddesses. And this was also advertisement uh, for their services, uh, moving on through. They had uh, what we consider floats that went along there, which, of course, obviously are, are you know, moved by uh, mules or horses So uh, in this procession. And, of course, you would have images of the gods, and it was all surrounded by... Uh, sprinkling of incense. Isn't that wonderful? So you do have, and oh, and always the pipers. The pipers would be playing alongside. So there you have it. Uh, then from there, you enter the famous forum of Pompeii. And so, you know, uh, you have the Basilica, the Temple of Apollo on, on the, the east side, the Temple of Jupiter on the north uh, east side, the Marsilium on the east side, uh, the building of Eumachia uh, on the southeast side of the Forum and the with the Temple of Layers and the Temple of Vespasian, the Hall of uh, the Deucarians on the south. So let's, again, I'm going to go a little fast, but I want to make sure we get an idea. So the Basilica uh, is a very sumptuous building on the Forum, and it was used at, for the place for the administration of justice. So the Forum uh, is a place for not only commercial, but political activities and justice was 
a, a very important part about that. Uh, in fact, uh, there is a place where the judges sat while judicial affairs were being managed, and that has survived the area. So you can go to the place and go, hey, this is where the judge sat and made various decisions. Uh, the Basilica dates from 130 to 120 BCE. Of course, you know, um, uh, you're going to have people who make some comments because, you know, hey, this is the law, you know, this is the place of justice. And not everybody's happy with what happens, right? The various verdicts. Um, so one person writes, a small problem gets larger if you ignore it. <laughs> so he found out the hard way. It's like, oh, great. I should, have, should not have let this one go. <laughs> but, you know, you know, and then, of course, you have um, uh, another one who's angry at somebody. He says, gee, I hope your hemorrhoids rub together so much that they hurt worse than they had ever were, 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 uh, felt before, which is terrible. <laughs> Sorry. He's, you know, so this person is pretty mad, I would say. Uh, this person by the name of Ephra kind of gets it a lot. You know, Ephra is not good at ball games in one place. Ephra, you are bald in another place. So I mean, it's, you know, it's probably one of the judges there who's kind of heckling. Uh, you also have somebody who's pretty upset with love. He said, let everyone in love come and see. I want to break Venus's ribs with clubs and cripple the goddess's loins. If she can strike through my soft chest, then why can't I smash her head with a club? <laughs> so pretty upset. I wonder if he got in trouble uh, for something as well, right? And of course, if you are able but not willing, why do you put off our joy and kindle hope and tell me always to come back tomorrow? So force me to die since you force me to live without you. Your gift will be, will be to stop torturing me. Certainly, hope returns to the lover uh, what it has once snatched away. So you're going to have, you know, this, and of course, you have some sad things. Uh, uh, Fearless writes, I grieve because I hear you have died, so farewell. Uh, somebody's angry. Cornelius, go hang yourself. You know, uh, the man I am having dinner with is a barbarian. Somebody writes, uh, oh, there's some, yeah. And this is my favorite one because this is filled with graffiti. All walls, you have held up so much tedious graffiti that I am amazed that you have not already collapsed in ruin. So, so people, I mean, you get, it's the human factor of all of this, right? And then, of course, in the northern section, uh, you have the Temple of Jupiter, uh, built in the mid-2nd century. What I want to say about this is that um, uh, it's a pretty big structure. And they did, found, they did find an uh, image of what looked like the head of, of Jupiter in there, big bust. And it was dedicated to the Capuline gods. But when they found it, it was, you know, it was scattered. I mean, it looked like, you know, there's, there's pieces of statues everywhere, portions of that. It's very clear that some of these statues, uh, how they were made, is that the, the parts that were, were marble or stone were the parts that are connected to the skin. You know, whether it be the head or the arms, but the rest was made out of matrix of wood. And so that would save money. So they're kind of cheap fashion ones. But it was all in disarray and not because of the eruption of Mount Vesuvius. It was already a mess then. So many scholars have said that this temple was decommissioned uh, because it did suffer earthquake damage back in 62. And there is evidence that uh, what happened is they transferred the worship of Jupiter over to another temple that was dedicated to Asclepius to temporarily hold the images uh, that were dedicated uh, to the Capuline gods. Uh, and, that's, uh, and that was, of course, to, uh, to uh, the um, uh, Jupiter uh, by the name, uh, excuse me here, uh, Jupiter of Miliculius. Miliculius means uh, that which, which is sweet, the sweetened uh, Jupiter. And what happens is, is that there was uh, a underworld form of Jupiter that was worshipped in the area uh, beforehand uh, that's connected to other kinds of things, even, even healing. Right? That's we get the Asclepian aspect. And what they basically said, hey, you know what? Jupiter is Jupiter. <laughs> you know, this one is a mess. It's a wreck, so we're going to take all the stuff there and bring it over to this other temple, and until it's fixed, 
that will have to work. Why I bring this up, why I think it's interesting, it shows that while the Romans view things as sacred, there is still a functional aspect to their mentality. <laughs> so not things are so sacred that they can't kind of play around uh, with the rules, so to speak. Okay, then you're going to have uh, what's called the Marcellum of Pompeii. And this was a, a place that was dedicated, much of it, to the imperial cult. So you have the various niches where the various representations uh, of the Roman uh, emperors and, of course, their, their family were to be worshipped. It's a very prominent place. And you can see there were ceremonial rooms and other, uh, nearby, and even um, um, a, a place that has uh, where you see the sacrifices were being done. So this is the imperial cult, very strong, right along the main area of the, the forum. Uh, there is many possibilities. People believe that the rear wall had an image of Augustus and Livia, along with Drusus and Tiberius. And Jupiter is, is, was having the globe. There is an image of the globe. One thing I want to bring about and make it very clear, the Romans believe the world was round. Don't, that they would tell you they think that's flat. And so you're going to have lots of images of, of, of emperors and others who are holding Zeus himself, right? And Zeus is also holding the globe of the earth. They've known this all the way back uh, since the 3rd century BCE with Aristophanes, uh, Librarian of Alexandria. And by the time you get to the Romans like Lucretius during the 1st century BCE, uh, he even talked about the world not only being around, but an equator area and temperate zones and two cold areas on either side. Does that seem, that's pretty amazing stuff. They didn't know this, so not a mystery. I, people forgot later on, but yeah, you're going to find this. Uh, okay, so you're going to see, um, moving on, I, I want to bring this up. You have another building that's very prominent, and it was uh, dedicated uh, possibly uh, to the Guild of the Fullers. Very big building. Uh, just south of this ritual site dedicated to, uh, the, to the, the, the emperor and his family. And it was created by, um, her name is Eumachia. It's a building, a structure, public structure, that was commissioned by a woman. Okay, a very prominent woman. She was a public priestess of the imperial cult of Pompeii uh, during the middle of the second century CE. She was also a matron of the Concordia Augustus, which was an imperial cult initiated by Livia, the widow of Augustus, dedicated to the divine Augustus. Uh, she was known as, uh, according to this, she did not come from wealth. She is a self-made woman that, from inconsequential origins, that because of her industry, because of her occupation, which most likely connects to the Fullers, you know, because of that, she worked her way up to the point where she had quite a bit of wealth. She did marry then uh, into a higher family. Uh, and, um, and of course, because of this, uh, one of the older families of Pompeii. And, uh, and what happened is, is that... Um, uh, she had enough money to dedicate and create a gigantic building that stands uh, in the middle of the forum of Pompeii. So when people say, hey, you know, women, there's diminished status, we've got to be very careful because this person came from a pretty, uh, you know, moved all the way up, I'm a woman that moved all the way up uh, through the various channels, married into a higher family, and represented the Fullers and dedicated a great building. So that's, that's kind of a big deal and it kind of changes things a little bit, right? Uh, so you see that. In fact, you're going to see lots of things dedicated by women uh, in the area. Uh, in fact, uh, let's keep on going. So to the south, you have the Temple of Vespasia. Just, be, just, you know, you think I didn't make my point strong enough. This was built uh, by Mamia. Who's Mamia? She, according to the inscription, she's the priestess, priestess of Ceres and the genius of Augustus. Wait, you mean you have one building dedicated uh, to the Fuller's Guild uh, uh, that was, uh, that was uh, you know, built by a woman? And then the, right next to it, on the south side of Vespasian, it's also dedicated and built by a woman? Yes, 
You guys are learning things. So it's not just one building, it's two in the public forum for all to see with various inscriptions. How is this? Right? So we again, wow. Uh, and you can see once again, this is a, this, this person right here. What I think is interesting is that she's from a freed slave background. So she's not only she's she's a former slave woman <laughs> uh, from the context of Augustus, and she moved all the way up to the top. So so one thing about Romans, there you know you do have a stratified society, but if you have the initiative, you have the genius, you can rise up no matter what your background is, even a former slave or even a complete nobody just by your focus and industry are we learning things at least during the first century and you can't forget that now uh, when you look at the foreign pompeii you'll never be the same now you think like wow wait wait it that changes things quite a bit okay there is here uh, a uh, we'll go for about like, like a little more minutes that's okay uh there is a marble altar it's four sides decorated with reliefs uh, located here what I like about this is it really does give us an idea of the worship at this time and animal sacrifices. So basically what you have is in the middle of this image, you have a tripod serving here as a portable altar. Next to it, the sacrificer. Uh, it could be a priest or it could be a political official because both did that on behalf of the community. Uh, he is reciting a prayer in the image while pouring an offering of wine with incense going on. He does wear a toga, but as proper, he covers part of his head with the toga uh, because you got to cover your head as you pray uh, in a submission uh, to the great Jupiter of all, right? Uh, and in the background, there are musicians uh, playing the double pipe, and you have attendants, including a child, bringing in other equipment, on the other side of the tripod, there's a, there's a bull uh, being led to the scene by three slaves, one of which is holding an axe uh, ready for slaughter. The bull is pretty big. And um, a lot of archaeologists kind of smirk at this because it is such a pristine, beautiful scene. And they liken it to be like a, like a portrait that's kind of fake because they said the reality of such a scene would have been completely chaotic. Because the bull would not be so happy about being brought to the altar, you know, and being axed, you know, and, and you have, you know, there would be ensuing chaos everywhere. But the, I guess the reality is, uh, is that this was, in a sense, the blueprint of how things should be. <laughs> so this is the decorum. This is how things should look like. But the reality was, and also the bull was way too big. They said, it, it, because looking at the various skeletons of the bulls discovered, they were quite a bit smaller. Uh, so we know that uh, they went the cheaper route when it came to these, uh, bringing these in. Uh, so there you have it. But, uh, and of course, uh, the idea of sacrifice, uh, which is fascinating, uh, was, you know, basically you, uh, the people are sacrificing the animal or the animals to the gods and making a connection between nature uh, and the various deities. So humanity becomes the middleman, so to speak. But the idea is also to connect with nature, uh, with their own nature, but also, this is so important, it's an act of community. Because you're doing this as a public act, and it's expected that people will share in the meat. So the priests get the meat, the populace get the meat, with the blessings of the gods, in fact, with the hospices, who, who take a look at the entrails to see if fortune is going to be good, like look at the, you know, the intestines. And the idea is they all participate together and it glues uh, the society uh, as one, which makes it difficult if you're vegetarian at that time, because you're believed to be outside of that. And because the, the meat was sacrificed to the gods, but it was also blessed by the gods. Does that make sense? And so what happened is, there's, there, were there vegetarians in those days? Quite a few, but they got themselves in trouble. And a large portion of them would later on be like Christians. Christians would be vegetarians. You didn't know that except for fish, which is not considered uh, meat from their perspective. Isn't that fascinating? So you're going to have and many philosophers couldn't eat, wouldn't eat the meat as sacrificed to the images. And that got them into a whole bunch of trouble too. And, you know, you, so you have philosophers defending themselves like, no, 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 
know, I, you know, I'm, I'm wild around just because I don't do those rituals. But there is that, that group pressure uh, there. And you can see this at this temple. It's a very public display. Does that make sense? Okay. Uh, moving on, we're getting close uh, to uh, what I know. I got to make sure. Yeah, we're good. Okay. So, uh, oh, yeah, I cover that. At the forum baths. By the way, the forum baths is the place where we find the images of those banners being held by various guilds that I mentioned. So that's pretty cool. Uh, you're walking the main street of Pompeii was the Via uh, del um, Omandaza, right? And uh, this, this goes all the way to the Porto di Santo, the, the, the Santo Gate. Uh, you pass by the Stadium Baths. The Stadium Baths are the oldest in, in, in Pompeii. In fact, dates parts of it date back to the 4th century BCE. So parts of these baths, they're pretty old, even though it was redesigned during the first century BC. Now, I want to bring these baths up intentionally because guess what? There is a separate women's section and men's section. So this bathing uh, complex was not shared. Uh, it's, it's not co-ed. It's very distinct. You have a men's section and a women's section. Uh, each has uh you have separate dressing rooms uh separate lockers and but they both go on to their own special uh, uh tipidarium which is the warm bath and then they all go to their specific cold darium which is the real hot bath but uh while the man had a nice refrigerarium which is the cold bath the women did not <laughs> So uh, they had a little area where they can bathe and get in cold water, but it was it was it was definitely not as nice. Now, uh, when you take a look at, at the refrigerarium, uh, it was richly decorated. Uh, this is the men's with garden scenes with a dome ceiling painted blue to represent the sky. It was pretty. Uh, the women's uh, bathing area was 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 not as nice, and you can see here there's not an equal treatment between the two genders, but again this is an older bath right this is an older establishment so we learn a lot that's because it's older you're going to have this division but later on that's going uh to uh change and of course um other bits and pieces oh uh, all right okay i gotta make sure i get to the goodies first you know let's see how much time we have okay we can do this um i'm, I'm holding it to the time right uh the fuller of stephanus was pretty interesting. Um, now, it's uh, how do I put this? It's a pretty, it's it's, it's the biggest laundry mat uh, in Pompeii. Uh, but eighteen laundries have been found throughout uh, Pompeii. So people were very much into cleaning their clothes. Uh, and uh, this one, it's a two-story laundry mat. And there's places where they have the pools. Pools of what? Well, yeah, of course, that's right. You got to clean things up. So uh, what happened? I got your attention, Eddie, on what? Uh, yeah, so uh, they need the, um, the ammonia uh, to really get out those stains. And uh, what they used to do is outside of this in the other laundry mats, there's like little basins where, you know, if you uh, have to go to the restroom, you know, number one, uh, then you just pee there. And then that's brought in and put into these, and they're, they're still there, uh, these, these, these pools. And then, of course, uh, it's placed right in there to clear it all out. They scrub it. And what interesting part about ancient times is that these slaves and others do everything with their feet. So, so they actually scrub it with their feet getting the stuff out and i kind of wonder and hopefully have a nice slight touch because your clothes will get torn otherwise right and the other part that's interesting is they even fold the laundry afterwards with their feet can you imagine that well then again if it's, you know it's urine like maybe see where they don't want to handle it maybe if, you know somebody was using their hands all the time and got sick and i could see that so at least there's a there's a little bit of distance so that's so that you have that um you get down and moving along, of course, you have the famous Temple of, of Isis. Uh, this, of course, uh, has two sections, an outer space surrounded by columns, which is known as the Pronaus, the inner area, Naus, which houses the statues of Isis and Osiris. It's kind of a fusion of, of Greek and Roman Egyptian uh, features. Uh, you have, um, this temple includes, it's called a Purgatorium. 
a roofless enclosure in the southeast corner of the, the courtyard uh, that uh, connects to a subterranean room with a basin for the Nile waters. The water from the Nile function as a holy water used uh, for various rituals. So you have uh, this. Um, you have um, also depictions of Isis is quite frequent. Um, you have uh, Isis uh, is depicted in one case having a serpent around her wrist and a crocodile at her feet. Uh, you know, they, you know when, it, when it comes to Egyptian religion, they're really into snakes. And so there's a mural of snakes guarding a wicker basket adorned with lunar symbols. I mean, they, snakes, snakes are everywhere. You also see that there's a large dining room, there's a kitchen, there's, they, they found a whole bunch of terracotta lamps, uh, back storerooms. It's a quite a large um, complex. And you can see where, uh, you know, way back when the 18th century, they're going, hey, forget Herculaneum. <laughs> oh, this ISIS thing is pretty interesting. And so there you have it. You have the Grand Theater, uh, which, of course, uh, is from the second century BCE. Uh, it was dedicated and, and built by the Halconis brothers, who are rich Pompeian vine growers. Uh, there's an inscription with uh, an seating area that was uh, sectioned off for the elder one of these who made the dedication, so it's still there. Uh, it accommodated uh, 5,000 people, seated in different areas. Now, I wanna, I wanna remind you that this was where, right, you know, uh, many people were at the time uh, of the, um, of the, uh, the, the uh, um, uh, eruption. But you're gonna have also uh, the various levels that have different classes. Uh, you're going to have, obviously, lots of graffiti everywhere. Oh, there's one that says, a copper pot went missing from my shop. Anyone who returns it to me will be given 65 bronze coins. 20 more will be given for the information leading to the capture of the thief. So people have not changed at all. You have a small theater, gladiatorial barracks also. Uh, one says in the gladiatorial bar barracks, Florinius, Privileged soldier of the Seventh Legion was here. The women did not know of his presence. Only six women came to know him. Too few for such a stallion. Okay. <laughs> it's like, there you are. You have a Doric uh, temple, uh, very ancient from the sixth century, uh, that is located there. And of course, the various houses, uh, the house of Laurinius Turbinius uh, occupies an entire block. Uh, residential area, but it has beautiful gardens and it has two fountains that used a hydraulic system to actually make the water uh, using various towers to shoot through the air. Uh, so we see a little bit of their aquatic uh, technology in a sense, right? Uh, beautiful gardens were here too. Uh, you have the house of uh, Julia Felix. I, I want to mention that in 62, uh, CE it suffered a um, earthquake damage, and it was a huge uh, villa, and they subdivided it into apartments afterwards. So uh, you can see that apparently uh, Julia's fortunes, her name is Julia Felix, apparently she was not so lucky, <laughs> Felix, uh, and she divided up uh, her apartments uh, in order to gain a certain amount of revenue. Uh, you see from here uh, the, the famous uh, uh, portrait of uh, the middle-class Pompeians, the, the husband and wife, the woman holding a stylus and wax tablet, emphasizing that she is educated and literate and is managing the bakery. So you have an educated woman who is literate that is emphasized in this particular image. And of course, you have the amphitheater that set 20,000 people. So that's a lot of people there. Uh, there was a 10-year ban, by the way, uh, uh, when it came to uh, doing activities in this theater. What happened is Tacitus writes, in 59 CE, there was a serious fight between the inhabitants of the two Roman settlements, Mercuria and Pompeii. It arose out of a trifling incident at a gladiatorial show. During an exchange of taunts, characteristic of these disorderly country towns, abuse led to stone throwing, and then swords were drawn. The people of Pompeii, where the show was held, came off best. Many wounded and mutilated Nicurians were taken to the capital. Many bereavements, too, were suffered by parents and children. The emperor instructed the Senate to investigate the affair. The Senate passed it down to the consuls. 
when they reported back the Senate that barred Pompeii from holding any similar gatherings for 10 years. Illegal associations in the town were dissolved, and the sponsor of the show and his fellow instigators of the disorders who were exiled. So, you know, things have not changed too much in Italy today. Uh, what happened in these kinds of, uh, of, of situations happened today all the time in soccer matches, <laughs> where violent crowds are still pretty characteristic and even as violent uh, as this. Obviously, there's so much more to say, but I believe that um, I gave a nice taste of what Pompeii was like uh, in ancient times. You can now imagine for yourself uh, unfortunately, the terror that these poor people had suffered, obviously, oh, I didn't have a lot of time to talk about the body count. I think that uh, just having the imagery uh, of what happened to them is, is enough to know uh, that so many suffered. And even though we look at this as a historical anomaly because it preserved such a large piece of Roman history, living history for us to experience, it's still a tragedy nevertheless thank you so much oh, here we go so we got a picture of you too see i'll get a picture of you too yeah here we go. we'll pretend there's thousands of other people there of course we have the people there on the screen okay. we're down to three okay that's okay Whew. So, any any questions from the three? I'll tell them that there's a question. Next. I just I put it in the chat. Oh, okay. But we can tell them too, like questions. Yeah. So, any questions, answers? Yeah. The urine-soaked laundry they rinsed that, right? Yeah. Okay. But but but, but still, it was it's still to get it off. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Can you imagine that? I know you missed it in uh, processing wool and cloth. And also to, to, to fix the, the dyes into the cloth. Oh, they use it for that reason too. Okay. You know, so a lot of those, a lot of those, most, those uh, uh, tapestries in medieval Europe, they were preserved through, you know, urine. And so they, you know, yeah, no, but yeah. Okay. Laurel asks, uh, Pliny the Younger thought the world was ending. Did the Romans have an eschatology involving fire? Did the Romans have an eschatology of fire? The Romans believed that the world could end. It could be completely destroyed, that there could be a consummation of all things. But they believed also that their moral character could avert the end of the world. They believed that if they followed the heroes of old and their, um, their example, uh, that they could indeed live. And this goes into the idea of the various ages of humanity, right? So you have the age, of course, gold, which, which, which is the age where we're, you know, all um, in, in uh, connected to the gods that we are, we're honoring the gods, giving them their due, uh, due honor. And then we, we fall to the age of silver, uh, which is the age of hubris, uh, where we have pride uh, before the gods that we believe that we did it for ourselves. And then we move into Ate, the age of um, confusion, delusion. And this is a period of, of chaos. And then we move, in, move into the area known as the age of uh, uh, nemesis, the age of, um, uh, so, which the previous is bronze, we move into what's called the Iron Age, the age of, of justice. So we are being judged by the gods. So the Romans believe that we lived, many of them believed, we lived in the age of judgment. We are being judged by the gods. We're being watched. And uh, in the sense, you know, see if we're naughty or nice, you know, if we're following. And what do we do is we look to the uh, example of, those who lived during the heroic age, which is wedged between the age of delusion, which is the age of bronze, uh, and the age of judgment, which is the age of iron. And this is the, these are those of the Iliad and the Odyssey. And so if we follow their models, uh, then we will be judged and will enter into a new golden age. However, if we do not follow what the heroes did, and we lack virtue, then many Romans believe that there will be a great consumption, that the Olympians uh, will, will, in a sense, pull back and let the Titans take over. And now we're back to the story of the giants, you know? So the guys, oh no, we've, we've been, and you can imagine that, uh, remember, uh, uh, Pompeii is like Las Vegas, not Las Vegas, but it's like Sin City, 
right? I mean, it's, it's a, it's a, you know, so I'm sure they're feeling pretty guilty, like, oh, great, you know, because because Romans were very strange when it came to their their morality. It's kind of a dualistic kind of, you know, you know, they everything's, you know, everything you can do, and but you better not do it. You know, and so there's this very strange uh, blend between conservatism and being very open. And this is a fight that goes on where Augustus will make, make various decrees because he is bringing in the golden age, according to Virgil. And he's bringing us into order in order for the Romans to thrive. And uh, but then you have this fear that uh, that if we don't do what's right, then the world would come to an end. And they believe that throughout the third century, during the time of the various emperors, where the world, uh, various military emperors, where it looked like everything is in chaos, just pestilence and everything else, they start to think that the world is coming to an end. And they blame the Christians because they are not worshiping the various gods of Rome. And so because of that, the gods are angry and they're leaving us to this uh, amount of destruction. When Rome was destroyed in 410, uh, uh, CE by the barbarians, there was an outcry, and many of those said it, the reason why it fell and everything in Rome is going to fall, the Western Roman Empire, is because of again Christianity. You know, it's their fault. And so, this destruction, and the barbarians are looked at as ones who are bringing the end of the world. So, yeah, the Romans believed that the world would end uh, in a possibly a big way, and, and major disasters uh, like what happened to Vesuvius kind of shock people into this mindset as we know from cassius dio and as well as as pliny hope that answers the question any other questions after the destruction of pompeii i've noticed through history you know, when uh, you know there's some really big disaster and people think that uh the gods are angry mm -hmm. there's uh a very uh restrictive age follows that where everybody obeys all of the rules yes and, uh, is very religious there's these cycles yeah did that happen after pompeii um it did not because because pompeii it happened in just campania see had it been something like uh rome on fire and being destroyed Rome had a pestilence. Had people kind of think a little bit more, and I'll, I'll be I'll be clear that uh, there was a little bit of conservatism that came in right after that. But and of course, people thought that when when Rome burned in in sixty four under Nero, because that's the heart of the empire, you know. But this is a this is this could be looked at as the pleasure area. Yeah, this is the, the this is the summer resort. And it's you know, and you, you think that well, that would make people think well, you know, hey, you, you know, their their morals, the way they are, uh, this bad thing happened. Maybe we, maybe we should shape up, but it didn't have that kind of impact. What did have impact, and this is a really important lesson, is the plagues, the pestilence. That actually is what got people into this sense of conservatism. You're going to see this after Lucius Verus brings back the pestilence uh from persia and the battles all of a sudden there is this ooh, you know we're all getting sick and it's pervasive and it covers the entire roman empire where everybody is sick now people are thinking this is it and so in the 170s and the 180s uh you're going to have this, this fear for a period of time and that's a that little decline that continues under marcus aurelius where there's like, ooh, ooh this is not good. Uh, you're going to have this happen a lot of times during the third century. And I would say that, and then in accompany that, at the same time as you're having all these plagues, you're going to have the barbarians uh, attacking not just one area, but all these areas. And then you're going to have, so so I think that for that behavior to happen, it has to be more, more worldwide or empire-wide. Empire uh, to have that kind of reaction. But then, yes, absolutely, there was a lot of conservatism. Uh, in fact, uh, a lot of joy went out of city life. And many city centers, uh, at the, at, you know, towards the, uh, after the time of Severus Alexander, during basically during the, uh, the 230s and 240s, uh, you know, there were a bunch of plagues and wars and everything else. After that point, many of these city centers never uh return to prominence again these cities just died the civic life was over 
and they became smaller little hubs. Sure, you have bigger cities like Alexandria, of course, Constantinople, Antioch that would you know would thrive, uh, but a lot of the smaller cities became very weak, and that especially Anatolia uh, and throughout Greece. Uh, even in Italy and in Spain, and so you're going to you see because you look around and go, wow, there's all this monumental architecture from the first and second centuries and the early third centuries, and all of a sudden it just stops. And then what happened? I mean, did they just leave? And once again, pestilence does its 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 job because what happens is that people die. There's less people to pay taxes, less taxpayers. You can't keep the infrastructure going and things collapse and including the you know even the aqueducts they they'll you know they can't repair the aqueducts and the barbarians will destroy them and and then now you don't have clean water anymore now it just kind of makes things even worse you know the roads break down they can't you know there's no uh no nothing to to rebuild the roads and people thought the world was coming to an end so pagans as well as christians believed you know that things are just going downhill uh, a, but 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 Pompeii and Herculaneum and Stabia, it, it was still still localized enough. But for those people living there, they thought this was it. For those people who are there, going, hey, this is, you know, because they, they don't they have no knowledge that this is not happening everywhere else. See, they have, they have no idea that you know it's not happening. You know, in Rome, they think that everything's collapsing around them because, as far as the eye can see. This is the way things are. And again, that is interesting when it comes to human nature. You know, if we're surrounded by this chaos with no further communication, uh, we are in a sense uh, susceptible to our own demons and our own fears and yeah, and hearsay. And you know, not enough information, people will always fill in those blanks. And oftentimes they'll fill in those blanks with the worst kinds of thoughts. And then of course, People like Pliny the Younger goes, hey, you know what? At least we're all dying together. <laughs> you know, we're all going down with the ship. Uh, but that's the perspective. Okay. Any other questions? That's it. All right. Well, thank you so much. And we're and uh, we're off. Okay. Good night, everyone. Good night. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Good night. There we go.